Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome to, to church. church. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. 
about how God's faithful love endures forever. Perhaps you'll join us in proclaiming this truth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His faithful, faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His, His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day and the moon and stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever.
We've just been blessed with a week off together as a family. A time for me to catch up with the family having had a bit of a nightmare period at work. In amongst the fun and games, I've also had some quiet times based around my daily Bible notes, courtesy of Jeff Lucas, which talked about King Jehoshaphat. I think he's now one of my new favourite characters from the Bible. He did a lot of good in God's eyes, but also got things wrong. It's the bit where he's fearful about a battle that seems to be heading his way. I admit to having battled with fear quite a lot lately, facing challenges at work hand in hand with the challenges Covid has provided. Don't get me wrong, I'm thankful I still have a job as some people have the uncertainty of having lost theirs. But delivering during the pandemic is also a whole other challenge. There are many of these challenges that would have perhaps had less of an impact on me if I'd taken the stance Jehoshaphat took. He prayed and talked to God, and one of my favourite parts is when he says, Oh our God, won't you stop them? We're powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. We have a good, good father who is on our side, and as Jehoshaphat finds out, a God who fights our battles with us and for us. Jehoshaphat headed out to that battle with people singing and dancing, and with the words we said together earlier, give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. We may not know what lies ahead, but God does. Whatever you're facing, whatever I'm facing, and are fearful of, we should talk to God and ask for his guidance. As Philip challenged us last week, may our prayer lives flourish and grow as we look to our good, good Father. God bless.
Revelation 6, 7 to 9. The man who is being taught the Christian message should share all the good things he has with his teacher. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. A person will reap exactly what he sows. If he sows in the field of his natural desires, from us he will gather the harvest of death. If he sows in the field of the Spirit, from the Spirit he will gather the harvest of eternal life. So let us not become tired of doing good, for we do not give up. The time will come when we will reap the harvest. So as we come to a time of remembrance, let us be quiet. Let us remember those that gave their lives so that we could have freedom. For me, often in this time of silence, I always end up at the foot of the cross, thinking about the one who gave his life for me so that I could be really free, free from sin, free from death. Yes, I remember those brave men and women who gave their life on the battlefield so that I could have freedom. But every year, every time I end up at the cross, thanking God for my salvation, thanking God for all of the great things that he's done in my life, thanking God for the answers of prayer, thanking God for the leading that he's given me, for his peace, his presence, thanking him that I can come and worship. So let us come. It's going to be different this year. Two minute silence is different for all of us, but it doesn't mean that we can't come and we can't bring our respect. So let us come and be silent and remember those that gave their lives so that we could be free. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
So, here we are, back in lockdown. Back into a strange old world where you can't see more than one friend at a time. And you never know which shops are going to be open and selling those all essential goods. I don't know about you, but I keep coming back to Psalm 137 over the last five months, where it says, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange land? Everything is strange and different. Not at all what we've wanted. I miss gathering with you. I, I miss worshipping with you. I miss hanging out with you. And to me, it feels like I'm in a strange land, wondering when I'll get to sing the songs of the Lord again with you. Though this is nothing new. And for our battleground hero, he had a similar experience to, uh, to us. Today, we are going to be looking at Daniel. The book of Daniel takes place after the first Babylonian attack on Jerusalem. Daniel and his friends were taken captive and escorted to the palace of the Babylonian king. And they were put into a position where they had to assimilate their captures culture and learn how to live. Much like we've had to get used to a new way of living. I don't know about you, but I have lost count of how many times I've set off to the shops without a face mask in my pocket. While we can't be certain, most of the scholars would put Daniel in his early teens when he was taken to Babylon. So we likely have a teenage boy who was abruptly removed from his hometown and taken to a foreign and pagan nation to serve a pagan god. This is a massively overwhelming event for anyone, let alone a teenager. Daniel, however, wasn't shaken. Despite what was going on around him, all that he had to learn, Daniel made sure that he maintained his faith and trust in God. So by the time when we get to chapter six of the book of Daniel, the bit with the lion's den in it, which Daniel is most well known for, much has happened to Daniel. By now, he's between 80 and 90. He's the prime minister of the kingdom of King Darius. And after seven decades in a strange land, Daniel could look back on a lifetime of God enabling him to thrive in a pagan context where his faith and confidence in God is stronger than ever. We have so much to learn from Daniel, who, like us, lived in strange times where the norm was no longer the normal. The first thing that I think we can learn from Daniel is not to compromise. Don't compromise. Daniel wasn't willing to compromise his standards. Right at the very start of Daniel's new life in this strange land, he had to decide if he was going to stay true to God and the way of life that he'd grown up with. Daniel 1 verse 8 says this, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Daniel decided that he wasn't going to compromise his faith, even in a strange land. Daniel didn't have to uphold his Jewish standards. He was away from home in a pagan kingdom. He could have eaten the royal food without a second thought. Daniel didn't have to maintain his Jewish standards, but he chose not to compromise. This teenager had the precepts of God and integrity deep within him. And that mattered to him. It mattered whether or not he pleased God. So it didn't matter what everyone else was doing around him. Daniel was not going to compromise his standards. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. It's been the cause of many people losing their faith. As followers of Jesus, we have decided up front, just like Daniel, that we're not going to compromise our biblical principles, no matter what. Just as Daniel resolved to honour God in all things, we must also determine that whatever comes our way, we're not going to forfeit what we know is acceptable in the sight of God. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. In these strange times, when it feels like we're living in a strange land, make no mistake, pressure will come. 
Somehow, some way, we're going to get negatively influenced. But if pleasing God and truly living according to his will is truly important to us, as it was to Daniel, it'll be easier than we think. Many people start well, but they don't always end well. Daniel was a teenager in the first chapter when he refused to eat the king's food and God blessed him. Now, in chapter six, Daniel's in his 80s, maybe his 90s, and he was still serving God, still working, still using his spiritual gifts. Daniel was a rare mix of both politician and a man of integrity. But this brought him enemies, those that wanted to see Daniel removed from office. Daniel had his roaring lions prowling around him, looking for an opportunity to devour him long before he ended up in the lion's den. Daniel 6, 4 says at this time, the chief ministers and the seraphs tried to find grounds to charge, to bring charges against Daniel in his con- conduct in government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could not find corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Daniel's resolve was not to compromise. He wanted to live a life of faithfulness. He had an outstanding worth ethic and integrity, which made it impossible for his advisories, adversaries even, to find any grounds for charges against him. They looked for grounds to charge Daniel, but they could not get any dirt on him. He was loyal to the king. He did not badmouth the king behind his back. He was good at his job. He wasn't lazy. He didn't come in late. He was honest, dependable and conscientious. If someone was looking to criticise you or I, would they have valid grounds? Would they find areas of compromise in our lives? How many of us today could stand such scrutiny as Daniel did on that occasion? Because of Daniel's lack of compromise and his consistent and prayerful focus, he grew in God. So as he grew in God, he grew as a person and as a leader. Even though they tried everything they could to find something wrong with Daniel, They couldn't find anything. Daniel was honest, trustworthy and dependable in all that he did. For there was no compromise in his life. He was exactly the type of person that a king would want as a prime minister. So, could you and I step into Daniel's shoes and wear them comfortably? Has there been a point in time? And does there continue to be a mindful act on our behalf not to compromise? That if something comes up that we know is contrary to God's words, that we're not going to join in any wrong behaviour. The world now, as it did then in Daniel's time, judges us not by our faith, but by our conduct. Is there any compromise in our lives that would weaken us as we step out onto the battleground? For we all have our roaring lions looking for reasons and ways to devour us. And the only way to defeat those lions is to be alert and a sober mind and have no compromise in our lives. Secondly, Daniel chose to trust. God was the central aspect of Daniel's life. He trusted God in all things. Early on in chapter six, we see that Daniel is forced into a corner that could make him compromise his faith. Daniel 6, verses 6 to 8 says, So these chief ministers and the seraphs went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal ministers, prefects, seraphs, advisers and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. In effect, Daniel was told that he could not pray to God any anymore, that he had to pray to King Darius. So what would Daniel do next? How did Daniel respond? It says in the Bible that when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Part of Daniel's daily routine was to kneel towards Jerusalem and pray to God three times a day. Everything in Daniel's life revolved around God. 
Nothing, not even the threat of death was going to stop Daniel from his devotion to God. And nothing would make him hide his spirituality. It was a life of godliness, lived in full view of others. This had been the pattern of Daniel's life since he arrived in Babylon. That he would be fully committed to God, trusting him at all times and in all ways. Daniel had lived in a strange world for several decades, but his trust in God had only grown in those years. Yes, it was hard. Yes, there would have been dark days. There would have been difficult days, but Daniel's trust in God saw him through. And that is the trust and faith that God is looking for us. It's a trust in God that sees us through the dark and difficult days. Daniel understood this. He understood that every day, the best thing he could do was to trust God, to seek God and to keep in a living and loving relationship with him. Despite what the new law said, Daniel's trust was fully in and on God, which challenges us to live a life fully committed to God, to obey him, to trust him, to submit uh, to his will and believe that whatever he allows in those times spent in a strange land will be for our benefit and his glory. Even if it means we end up with an overnight stay in the lion's den. Daniel was more at rest with the lions than King Darius was in his palace with all his creature comforts. Daniel had complete trust in God before and during his stay in the lion's den. I wonder if you ever feel that you're stuck in circumstances that are outside of your control. That parts of our lives aren't really in our control. That it feels like we're living in a strange land. That things like our family, our health, our future, all that stuff are all a little uncertain. Or maybe you're feeling like you're in the lion's den already. That the prowling lion is coming to harm you. Know this, that God is always working for your ultimate good. We have seen over the last few weeks that time and time again, as our battleground heroes have stepped onto the battleground, that God has been testing, refining and developing their faith years before they needed to step onto the battleground. That the one thing that they all have in common is that they trusted God in all things and at all times, even if their faith was a little wobbly at times. Psalm 91 says this. That God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and on the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. That was Daniel's experience. He told the king that an angel had come and shut the mouths of the lions and kept him safe. What God? What's most in our lives is that, we, is that we trust him, as Daniel did. I think that Daniel's daily times with God, his lack of compromise, his trust in God was the huge reason why he was able to remain calm and faithful when his life looked like it was crashing down all around him. Please don't push God into the background of your life. Daniel shows us that God needs to be the central part of our lives, that everything else in our lives should revolve around God and not around us. Pushing God to the background isn't the way we should treat someone whose incredible grace saves us each and every day. The Bible calls us to love God with all our hearts, all our songs and all our minds. So is there any compromise in our lives? Do we need to deal with one or two things right now? To surrender afresh to God, to recommit our lives back into his hands, to trust God with everything in our lives, even if we're living in a strange land. And especially if we hear the roar of the prowling lion that is looking to devour us. Trust God and let him send his angels to protect you and keep you safe. The third thing that we learn from Daniel is don't ever give up. Daniel didn't waver when the hardships arose. Galatians 6, 79 says this, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. 
Let's not become weary in doing good. For in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Sometimes when living in a strange land or when we can hear the distant roar of a prowling lion, it can be very tempting to give up. Daniel must have been extremely busy in his life. He had the top government job, but he found time to leave his office and go home and pray. We're not told how long he prayed for. It doesn't say that he prayed for three hours each time, but that he prayed three times a day. Daniel prayed every day, not just when there was a crisis. He had prayed every day for years. His prayer was not occasional. It was regular. He prayed daily, not because he had to, but because he loved to pray. So when Daniel heard the new the new 30 day restriction on prayer, he didn't give up. He didn't say, oh, well, that's it. I just can't pray to God anymore in this strange land. No, Daniel did the same thing he'd done three times a day for months, years and decades. Daniel went to his house and prayed to God. Successful people often joke that they've spent years in becoming an overnight success. What many don't realise is it's the things that no one sees that result in the things that everyone wants. It's the faithfulness not to give up, to do the mundane things well, to develop productive habits, to remain faithful. That eventually leads to success. Daniel wasn't an overnight success. His faithfulness and trust in God made him the man who was able to have faith in the lion's den. He went into the lion's den with faith and courage. He was able to rest and sleep with the lions because he didn't give up. Didn't give up his daily discipline of prayer. It equipped him to face the darkness of the lion's den. While both peers, a prowling lion, were attempting to destroy Daniel, he chose not to give up, but to trust God in all things and at all times. So can I say to you in love today, don't give up. Each one of us daily face a lion's den. It's where we live. It's what we do. It's where God has called us to step onto the battleground. We live in a lion's den. We're in it every day. We have an enemy who, like a roaring lion, wants to devour you, your marriage, your children, your reputation, your church. That's why we should never give up. There's only one way to defeat a prowling lion, according to Ephesians 6, 18. We should pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. In other words, don't give up. Be a person of prayer. Be alert because you live in a lion's den. For no matter what type of lion's den the enemy has thrown you into, God is able to deliver you. Furthermore, no matter what type of spiritual lion is threatened to consume you today, God can shut its mouth. The same God who sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth that Daniel faced is the same God that is with you today. As with Daniel, don't you dare give up. Know that God is sovereign. The psalmist tells us, as for God, his way is perfect. Psalm 18. If God's ways are perfect, then we can trust whatever he does and whatever he allows to come our way is also perfect. We may not encounter a real angel like Daniel did, but we will see God work in our life. We should see our prayers answered. We should see real miracles. We should see God do amazing things in our lives. For he is able to do exceedingly more and abundantly more than we ask or imagine. That's what it says in Ephesians 3. Take this in. That God actually allowed Daniel to be put into the den. Just as previously he had allowed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to be put into the fiery furnace. Just as he allowed Paul and Silas to be cast into prison. In the same way, perhaps, God has allowed you to be cast into a lion's den of ill health, loss, sorrow or some other testing. How did Daniel react? He didn't give up. He didn't compromise and he trusted God in all things at all times. He put his whole trust in God. And when he was in a strange land and when he went into the lion's den, at all times, Daniel never gave up his hope and trust in God. And we need to be the same. So what next? As we are about to start a new week, another week in a strange land at strange times. 
Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to never compromise your faith. Dare to trust God and dare never to give up. You have been called to step onto the battleground. We have all been called to be salt and light. So if we don't compromise, we will have a good testimony. People will be affected. If we trust God to protect us at all times, then those around us, like King Darius, will see what God does through you and they will be affected. So when Darius witnessed the miracle in the lion's den, he became a believer. So don't ever give up. Each one of us has a hope, a genuine Christian hope that is based on God's salvation, his power and his presence in and with us. So step onto the battleground with confidence. Defeat the prowling lions in your life and see what God will do in and through you. God bless you as you step on to the battleground.